Okay, good afternoon. So let me just first, there was one little detail, if you remember, that we had left open for last time, but actually the, it's, it's almost a trivial, um, trivial observation is that actually if you have, I will not repeat, okay, you, you remember where it was in the notes from uh, last lecture. If you just take the supremum over x, y, z in some interval omega of f double prime of x over f prime of y times f prime of z, the supremum of all possible combinations, this is clearly less than, this is equal to actually, equal to, yeah, equal to the supremum over all x, y in omega of f, w, Y squared because you take the supremum of all possibilities, right? So this was uh, in a conversation with Hoku and and, uh, and Salako, I think yesterday we realized this. Since this is the supremum, then of course it means all possible combinations of this. So of course this is always uh, less than or equal to this one because if one of the you can always take here uh, the biggest one of these two. Right, and you can put it in here. Or the smallest one, the smallest one of these, right? And so this is equal, less than or equal to k. So what we had is, we had this as our assumption, okay? And we had this that came out in the proof in the equation, and we just needed to show that this was less than or equal to k, so it's this simple observation. Okay, okay so let's get back to what we completed last time. So last time we completed the proof of the fact that if we have a piecewise C1 map that is uniformly expanding and satisfies a certain property, which is this property here, then Lebesgue measures are ergodic. So today the first thing I want to do, two things, depending on how much time exactly we have. The first is an application of this result to a specific uh, map called the Gauss map. So the Gauss map is a very classical dynamical system that was studied by Gauss for reasons that are slightly different from the ones we are studying today because it has some connection to number theory related to continued fractions. But this is the map. X goes to 1 over X mod 1. So this is a very interesting map because it turns out that it is indeed a full branch map. So what does the map look like? So for all n in n, we have that f maps the interval 1 over n plus 1, 1 over n. What's that? Uh, okay, okay, let's just map zero to zero. Let's, okay, let's map it on the open interval. Okay. <laughs> no, it's true, this part is true, because 1 over n to 10 to 0. No, this part is okay. Well, when 0 goes to 1 over 0, it's not really well defined, but. No, no, no. What okay. was this zero is okay, but this zero was okay. Ah, here it's okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, but we want to iterate it. Okay. We can also define it just to be zero in zero. F of zero equals zero, and F of x equals one over x at all other points if we want. Okay. So this is a full branch map. And you can easily see what the structure of this map is. So it maps the interval one half from one half of one. It maps to um, um, 
let's see, so three quarters, so something like this, I think. Uh, And then it maps the interval one third, one half, also to the whole thing, to everything. It's not piecewise affine, right? It's uh, got a small, uh, it's the derivative changes a little bit. And then one fourth, one third, like this, and so on. It's got countably many branches. So F is a C1, piecewise, is a piecewise C1, full branch map. Lebesgue measure is not invariant in this case, right? Because if you take an interval here, a, b, this is not piecewise affine. So the pre-images, it has a countable number of pre-images, right? And the sum of them does not correspond to this Lebesgue measure. But Gauss himself, he found an invariant measure for this map, a very explicit invariant measure for this map. So let mu is called the Gauss measure. and is given by mu of a equals 1 over log 2, the integral of a, integral of a of 1 over 1 plus x dx, the mu dx, or dm. Let's put Lebesgue measure here. So what we're going to prove is this theorem. It says that mu g, mu is invariant and ergodic. So let's prove, first of all, that it's invariant. This we're going to prove directly. Lemma 1 mu is invariant. Um, so let A equals AB be an interval. And then we have that mu of A is equal to the integral, is equal to 1 over log 2 integral AB 1 over 1 plus x dm. And this is just the integral over this interval, which is, in fact, 1 over log 2 times log of 1 plus b over 1 plus a. You can compute this integral explicitly in this case. So what do we need to do? We need to estimate. So this is the measure. This is the measure. This is what this measure gives to this interval, a, b. Of course, it depends on the positions of a and b, and that's what you get. And now we look at the pre-image of a and b. So a, a equals a, b has 
a countable number of p images. Okay, so mu of the p image of a b is equal to mu of the union of the union n equals 1 to infinity of the intervals 1 over n plus b, 1 over n plus a. Because that is exactly what the form of these pre-images is. So if you look at the explicit form of the map, okay, and you look at these pre-images, so these are two points such that this, 1 over x, 1 over this gives a, 1 over b gives this, and so all the images are, ex uh, are exactly of this form for all the different values of n. Okay, you can calculate them explicitly. So this interval here is 1 over uh, 2 plus b over 1 and 1 over 2 plus a. Yeah. Okay. So this interval here this is the interval 1 over 2 plus b and 1 over 2 plus a right when you take this and you take 1 over x so this maps to 2 plus a mod 1 which is equal to a, right? So this point here, so it's the other way around. This is 2, uh, yes, b and a. This is a maps to here, right? You can easily see that the image of this interval maps to a, b, right? Because you take 1 over a of this gives m plus a mod 1 gives a. And this 1 over m plus b, 1 over this mod 1 gives b. Okay, so these are all the pre-images of these intervals. So this is what we need to estimate. We want to show that the measure, mu measure, defined like this, of this union is exactly equal to the measure of AB. Okay, so this is just going to be a direct calculation, another one-line calculation. So what is the measure of this union? These are all disjoint, right? So we can write this as the measure of the sum. So we can write this as the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over log 2. And then for each interval, since that is an interval, we will use this formula here. So we will get log. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit cramped here. Log of, let me write it like this, 1 plus b, which in this case is this, the second endpoint, right? 1 over m plus a divided by 1 plus 1 over m plus b. And this is equal to 1 over log 2, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of, if you kind of uh, multiply this out, and actually I want to write this as a product, so I take the log out. Let me take the log out and write this as a product, n equals 1 to infinity of, um, okay, if I kind of simplify this, what I get is n plus a plus 1 over m plus a times m plus b over n plus b plus 1. And if I write this out, this is 1 over log 
two log. So what is this product? So for n equals 1, I get 1 plus a plus 1 over 1 plus a times 1 plus b over 1 plus b plus 1, right? Times, now I put in n equals 2 here, and I get 2 plus a plus 1 over 2 plus a times 2 plus b times 2 plus b plus 1, okay? And I continue like this. And you see that a lot of things cancel. So what cancels? We have here um, 2 plus a cancels this 2 plus a. 2 plus b here cancels this. Um, and then these other ones are also going to cancel with what comes afterwards. And what you're going to be left with is just the log 1 over a. So if you write the next term, you will see that these cancel also. And so we get that 1 over log 2 times log of 1 plus b over 1 plus a, which is exactly the definition of mu of a, b. Yes. In order to enter this sum inside the operation, we have to know that this sum converts. How do we prove that this sum converts? In order to sum is here. Well, you're just doing term by term. I mean, you're just writing the sum. If, if it's, it was finite, it was OK. But since it's infinite, then we need some convergence. But uh, we can easily estimate this, I guess. It's OK. Yeah, I think it's fairly straightforward, in fact, to see that it converges. So this is very unusual to have an explicit formula for the invariant measure like this. It's very, very special case. There's a couple of other examples, but in general, it's very unusual. In this case, however, we have an explicit formula, and so we can check directly by this calculation that this is indeed invariant. So this way, this proves that we have this measure that is invariant. Now, what we're interested in is ergodicity. So this is when we would like to apply our result from the previous lecture, because this is exactly a piecewise C1 full branch map. What did we prove in the previous lecture? Can we just apply our result here? That's right. So there's two issues. One is we need to check the conditions. Okay? So we would need to show that it's uniformly expanding and it satisfies this condition on the second derivative over the first derivative squared. We can show that in a second. But what is the conclusion of the theorem that we proved last time? Ergodicity of what? The Lebesgue of Lebesgue measure. But this is not Lebesgue measure. But this measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag measure. Is that enough? No. In order to this measure, we have to prove these measures are equivalent. I think. This is absolutely continuous with respect Yes, equivalent means that they're both absolutely continuous with respect to each other. 
which is not always the case, but often is. Okay, let's go step by step. First of all, let us show that Lebesgue measure is invariant. So, um, first we show, sorry, is there a God? First show that Lebesgue is ergodic, so we need to show two lemmas. Lemma two is that f is uniformly expanding. Is this true? Why? Okay, I will leave that as an exercise because it's very simple. Okay, so the derivative is actually everywhere bigger than or equal to 1. It's only equal to 1 at the point 1. It's everywhere bigger than 1 except at the point 1. But remember, uniform expansivity does not need the derivative to be bigger than 1 everywhere. It just needs, for example, the second iterate of the map to have derivative bigger than 1 everywhere. It needs to satisfy that slightly weaker definition that I gave. So let me leave that as an exercise. Good exam question, this one. <laughs> Lemma two. Um, supremum over all x, y, in the partition, uh, oh, sorry, x, y in omega, so supremum over all omega in the partition, supremum over all x, y in omega of f double prime of x over f prime of y squared less than or equal to k. So there exists k such that this is true. I will leave also this as an exercise because all you need to do is calculate the first and second derivatives and check this. So then Lebesgue measures ergodic. So then we need just one more lemma says the following. So, sorry, that was lemma two. Let me call this lemma three. Let me call this lemma four. Is that if um, F, this is a very general lemma, F I to I is a measurable map. Mu1 is a probability measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to mu2. Then, if mu2 is ergodic, implies that mu1 is ergodic. Okay, which is what you were saying before. So we don't need them to be equivalent. We just need one to be absolutely continuous with respect to the other one. Um, Is it one side sorry? Is it one side if mu1 no, 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 because this is mu1 is absolutely continuous with respect to mu2, and we will use that. Okay. Remember what absolute continuity means? It means that if something has mu2 measure 0, then it's got mu1 measure 0. That's the direction of the implication. Okay? And so it's easy. So we want to prove that mu1, we assume that mu2 is ergodic, we want to prove that mu1 is ergodic. Right? So how do you prove ergodicity? Again, let A be a measurable set, and suppose that mu1 of A is greater than 0. Okay? We show that mu1 of A is full measure. This is what we need to show to show that it's ergodic. 
Sorry? Yes. Thank you. Uh, but A. So by absolute continuity, we have that mu2 of A is positive, right? Because if mu2 of A was 0, then mu1 of A would be 0. That's the direction of the implication of absolute continuity. And by ergodicity of mu2, This implies that mu2 of A equals 1. And this implies that mu2 of I minus A equals 0. And this implies that mu1 of I minus A equals 0 by absolute continuity. And this implies that mu1 of A equals 1. So this is what I meant when I said, I made a comment when I stated the theorem about the ergodicity with respect to Lebesgue. Even though Lebesgue measure was not invariant, the fact that we were able to prove that Lebesgue measure is ergodic gives a fairly strong statement in the sense that any other measure that is invariant and absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue will automatically be ergodic because of this simple lemma. So in a particular case, is this measure here absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue? Yes. Okay, so this Gauss measure, because of this form, it has a smooth, it has a density here. It is of the form where it's given by the integral of some density, and so it's automatically absolutely continuous, because if you take a z set that has zero measure with respect to Lebesgue, you will get zero for this integral, and so you would get zero for mu. So that gives absolute continuity, okay? So mu is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, and so mu is ergodic. Okay? And this completes the proof of the ergodicity and invariance of the Gauss measure for the Gauss map. Okay, so now Let me complete, finish with a, a, a proof. I will not, unfortunately, I think, be able to finish completely this proof. But I think I want to talk about it a bit because it's really a kind of key and natural question at this point. So we've studied piecewise affine maps, right? maps like this. Um, and we've studied maps, and we've proved that if you take so for piecewise affine, so, so what we have is for piecewise affine, we have that Lebesgue measure is invariant and ergodic. And for piecewise C1, plus uniform expansion, plus um, that condition on the second derivative, right? Plus the condition that f2 over f1 squared is bounded. This implies that Lebesgue measure is ergodic, but not necessarily invariant. OK? 
Okay? As I mentioned last time, what we're interested in is invariant ergodic measures, because even though the ergodicity of Lebesgue, because the ergodicity of Lebesgue does not give us the Birkhoff's ergodic theorem to study the statistics of orbit. So we've applied this to the specific case of the Gauss measure, in which to the Gauss map in which we know the measure explicitly. Okay? And because that measure is absolutely continuous, we apply this map and we get the ergodicity of that measure. But what about in general? You know, a very simple situation in which you, these properties are satisfied is if, for example, you have just the map, a piecewise affine map, like 2x mod 1. Right? And then you perturb this a little bit. So I change this map. I take a small C1 perturbation, for example, and I just take something that is piecewise C1, almost piecewise affine. But of course, in this way, it destroys all the structure that we have from here, and it becomes something like this, right? And it's easy to show that it's uniformly expanding because the derivative was constant equal to 2 here. So if you make a sp small perturbation, the derivative will be close to 2. This is trivially satisfied because F1, well, because uh, uh, F2 is bounded away from zero. Everything is bounded away from zero and infinity. So it's very easy to show that this is true. So in this case, we still get the Lebesgue measures ergodic. But do we have another measure that is, for example, absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure in this case? This is the question, right? So in this context, is the much more general context, the fact that Lebesgue is ergodic is useful if we know that we have an absolutely continuous invariant measure. That will give us an absolutely continuous invariant and ergodic measure. So the question is, when does there exist an invariant measure mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the big measure? Because that is really the f outstanding question that comes from this study you would expect that there should be. Because look, you've just made a very small perturbation here. Here is Lebesgue measure. You make a very small perturbation. Lebesgue measure is no longer invariant, but you'd expect that there should be some invariant measure that is similar to Lebesgue. OK, and that should have this. So theorem. F I to I piecewise uh, no so um, yeah piecewise C one full branch with a bounded distortion property. So remember, assuming the bounded distortion property is more general than assuming uniformly expanding in that condition on the second and first derivatives, right? So, um, okay, then F admits a unique ergodic invariant probability mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. So this you could consider the kind of theorem that we have lead, been leading up to right from the very beginning of the course. 
because what this means is that for almost every point, for Lebesgue, almost every point, so we have our interval here, 0, 1, right? And this means that for almost Lebesgue, almost every point, you have, you can describe the statistics of the orbit using Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. So the basin of attraction of this measure has positive measure, so this is a physical measure in the sense in which I defined physical measures right at the beginning of the course. So this gives a very general class of systems for which you have a physical measure in this way. Yes. Because that will satisfy this theorem, right? So if I take, um, so if I take, for example, if I take, well, any piecewise affine, let me not take it so special. Let me just take a piecewise affine map like this. And let me now take some small perturbation, or not even a small perturbation, just small perturbation like this, right? Then it is a piecewise C1, full branch, and it satisfies those two conditions which imply the bounded distortion property, right? So it they satisfies uniform expansivity, and the second derivative over first derivative squared is bounded. And so it, in particular, it satisfies the bounded distortion property. So this theorem, applies to this class of example, and much more generally. You know, what it says is that if you take any map, even with a countable partition, and you have this bounded distortion property, right, which you can check using, for example, the uniform expansivity and the second derivative or the first derivative squared, then there is an absolutely continuous invariant measure, probability measure. So the Gauss map becomes a special case of this theorem also. In general, we cannot have an explicit form of, the, of, this, of, the, uh, of this measure which we have in the Gauss map, but that is a special case of this. Okay. Yes. I noticed that all the time when people have a C1 perturbation, it always looks somehow useful. Yes, no, I'm just giving some examples here. As I said, if you remember, I mentioned, I think, the, uh, the previous course, if your map is not continuous or not generally, if it's piecewise C1, then it's not completely clear what we mean by a C1 perturbation because you could also perturb a little bit the point at which this changes. But uh, it doesn't matter. In this particular case, it doesn't matter because any reasonable way, as long as the perturbation continues to be full branch and has the bounded distortion property, then this will apply. So really, we don't really want to think of these as C1 perturbations of piecewise affine maps. This is just a very general class of systems. I'm just giving you the example. Uh, the, the reason why I use this example is because I say that even though in the piecewise affine Lebesgue measures invariant and ergodic, even if you make a smallest perturbation, you lose the invariance of Lebesgue measure. And in principle, you have no idea what you've got, even if you make a very small perturbation. Okay, But that case is covered by this theorem because any small perturbation in any reasonable sense will continue to satisfy these properties. And therefore, this shows that you continue to have an invariant measure. A very interesting question is, is this measure close to Lebesgue measure? You know, when you take a kind of perturbation, will you get an invariant ergodic measure that is close, for example, in the weak star topology to the other measure? You know, does the measure change continuously with the map? Right? This is a very interesting question, and this is studied in many dynamical systems. And in this case, it's fairly easy to show that yes, indeed, this is the case, because this, which is what you expect, right? Because even though Lebesgue measure is not ergodic, if 
you, if you make a small change, then you know the measure will shift around, but it will be close to the original measure in the, in the weak star sense. So it is also possible to show that, um, that this measure depends continuously on the map if you define the topology on this class of maps in a way that is reasonable. But this is, a, this is a really much more general problem and it's very well studied and in many cases we do not know the answer, okay? So I have now given you uh, some foundations in this course. This class of full branch maps are kind of a basic class of maps. And really you can use these techniques to construct absolutely continuous invariant measures and other physical measures for many different dynamical systems and in general, after you've proved the existence of such a measure, the next question is, okay, does this measure depend continuously on the perturbation? It's a very interesting question. It's a kind of stability. It's like structural stability. In a topological sense, structural stability means that as you change things, there's no bifurcations. The topological structure stays the same. From an ergodic theory point of view, you want to know if the measure depends continuously on the map. So I will not have time to prove this, but almost, okay, I will just give you a sketch of the argument and I will leave one proposition unproved because we don't have time, but it's really not very difficult. It's the same kind of techniques and calculations that we have been doing so far. So how do we prove, so what, what do we really need to prove here, right? What have we already proved? All we need to prove is that there exists a measure that is invariant and that is absolutely continuous because the ergodicity we get for free, because we've already proved that Lebesgue measure is ergodic, so if we get a measure that is absolutely continuous, it will also be ergodic. So all we need to prove is to find a measure that is absolutely continuous and invariant. So we start with Lebesgue measure. So let M is Lebesgue measure. And then we define a sequence of measures, mu N equals one over N, sum fi star n so do you remember the definition of fi star fi star m of some set a is defined as exactly it's defined as the measure of f minus i of a so remember, we already used a similar kind of sequence right at the beginning of the course when we we're showing the existence of invariant measures. And this also gives you some clue, right? So by the same argument, we know that any weak star limit point of this is invariant, basically, right? So um, by previous arguments, any weak star limit point is F invariant. It's not completely the same because we used, in the argument we used before, we needed to use the fact that F is continuous, which is not the case here, okay? If we have time, I will give you by, uh, by, uh, maybe I should say by arguments similar, similar to previous arguments. So if we have time, I'll, I'll show you the, just the calculation in this case without using the deficit continuous. But the point is that it's not that difficult to show that any limit point is invariant. So what we need to show, and, and, and you know why there exist accumulation limit points of this? Do you remember? Yeah, by the compactness of the space of probability measures simply, right? Because each of these is a probability measure. The average is also a probability measure. You have a sequence of probability measures, so there exist weak star limit points by compactness. So there exist limit points. Any such limit point is F invariant. All we need to show is that the limit point is absolutely continuous. Okay? So why should it be absolutely continuous? So notice that 
mu n is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. Do you agree with that? Why is mu n absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure? From the definition, because if you take a set that has zero Lebesgue measure, then its pre-image will also have zero Lebesgue measure. So this will be zero. So this will be zero. So mu n will be zero. So it's absolutely continuous. So that should be it, right? Does that imply that the limit? No. Sorry? Yes. Ah, OK. Well, this is because this map is non I mean, this is uh, the bounded distortion implies that this map cannot send a set of a positive Lebesgue measure to a set of zero Lebesgue measure. Right? This map, if it was to send the pre-image of any set of zero Lebesgue measure, has to have zero Lebesgue measure. Otherwise, you'd have a set of positive Lebesgue measure mapping to a set of zero Lebesgue measure, which would mean you have some kind of degenerate. As if, for example, if the map was constant, then you would do that. You'd send a map of positive Lebesgue measure to, to a single point, which has zero Lebesgue measure. Right? But this cannot happen because of the bounded distortion property. The bounded distortion property says that all the ratios are preserved. Okay, so, um, okay, let me write this. So since F is non singular, okay, positive. The big measure sets map to positive the big measure sets. So you're right. This is something that perhaps I could spend a little bit more time on, but I won't because time is so short. Okay. But it does depend on the fact that the bounded distortion implies the map is non-singular, and therefore this is absolutely continuous. Yeah. But is that enough? If each mu n is absolutely continuous with respect to m, does that imply that the limit point is absolutely continuous with respect to m? Yes. And that's why it's zero. Any anybody disagree? So suppose we try to do this exercise with the following map. So suppose we take the map that you know very well, 0, 1 to 0, 1. x goes to x over 2. It's not full branch, but we can still construct this sequence. And we can still take the limit. And we still have this absolute continuity property. So, so what does the measure F? 
star of M look like for this map here? So Lebesgue measures Lebesgue measure on zero one. What does F star of M look like? Two multiplied by measure of A. So let's see. F star of M of A is equal to measure of f minus 1 of a. So let's take a set here. What is the measure of this set under f star m? So we look at the pre-image of a. So we go, what we need to do is we need to take the diagonal. So we need to look at A here. And then we need to look at the pre-image, which is this. This is F minus 1 of A. Excuse me? Right. It's empty set, exactly. So what is the measure of that set if we take A there? It's zero. So not all sets have positive measure. Which sets have positive measure? Where does this measure live? Zero to one half. Exactly. Right? Because if you take a set between zero and one half, then you calculate its pre-image, it will be somewhere and it will be twice as big. Right? But if you take a set between 1 half and 1, it has no pre-image. So the measure will be 0. So this measure is completely living inside the interval 0, 1 half. Not only that, but if you take a set between 0, 1 half, its measure will be exactly twice the Lebesgue measure of this set. Okay? So what does the density of this measure look like? The density of this measure looks like um, something like this. Right? This is 2. So the density d f star m with respect to dm is equal to 2 on 0, 1 half. So you get a measure that is living here and its density is equal to 2 in the sense that you need to multiply the Lebesgue measure by 2 to get the F star N measure. What if we do this again? What if we look at F2 star N of A is equal to M F minus 2 of A? What is this measure? Where does this measure live? By 4. So this measure here lives in 0, 1 over 4, and its density is 4. Because if you take a set in here and you look at this measure, you need, you need to pull it back twice so it becomes 4 times as big as it was. So the F star 2 M measure of A is 4 times the Lebesgue measure of the set A. So it's living on 1 fourth and its density is 4. It's still a probability measure, right? Because if you take the whole interval 0 to 1 fourth, its measure is 1. Because you need to multiply its length by 4. And you get the measure equals 1. So you get a sequence of probability measure. Each one of these is absolutely continuous. Right? This one is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue in the sense that if you take a measure with a set with 0 Lebesgue measure, F star of M of A will be 0. Also, if you take a set here with zero Lebesgue measure, you multiply by four, you still get zero Lebesgue measure. So each one of these is absolutely continuous. But what is the weak star limit of these measures? That's right. The weak star limit is the delta zero 
is the Dirac delta in zero, which is the only limit you can expect because that is the only invariant measure that exists in this map, remember? Because what does this map do? Every point converges to the point zero for this map, right? So Fn of x converges to zero for all x, okay? So the delta Dirac in zero is the only only invariant measure. And since this sequence, or in this case, you don't even need to take the averages even, this actual sequence itself converges to, the Dirac, that converges to an invariant measure, this sequence converges to an invariant measure, then it has to converge to Dirac delta. And you can see it explicitly. This is actually a very nice example of where you see how this sequence of measures accumulates on a measure, okay? So this example, which I would like you to review at home very carefully because it's an important and very useful example because it, you can really see explicitly how these behave, is an example of a sequence of absolutely continuous invariant measure, in measures, not invariant, absolutely continuous uh, measures converging in the weak star topology to a measure that is not absolutely continuous. Yes. That's right, that's right. The fact that the set of probability measures is compact is just a general theorem of functional analysis, that the unit ball uh, in the dual of the continuous functions is compact in the weak star topology. Yes. That's right. What we proved is that the set of invariant measures is also a compact subset of this compact set. Okay, so all of this example was just to emphasize the fact that we need some estimates here. We need to use the properties of our full branch maps, right? Because what we've done here is completely general. I did not really use any properties. I need either continuity or something to show that the limit point is F invariant, but certainly the absolute continuity, I can do this in very general situations like this, and the limit is not necessarily absolutely continuous, even though each measure is so, if you, in relation to this, it seems natural that what is happening, so what is going wrong here, what is going wrong is that the density is blowing up, right? So even though each map is absolutely continuous, the region where this density is living is getting smaller and smaller and the density is blowing up. So if we can co control the density of these, then we should be able to guarantee that it's absolutely continuous. And this is just the proposition that I will state. I will not prove it. But it's not that difficult to prove. So let H N equals D mu N by D M. This is the density of each of these measures because each of these measures is absolutely continuous. So it has a density. And the proposition, the main proposition, says that there exists k greater than zero such that What is what? 
soup. Here? Yeah, supreme. And, okay, we will not use this, but let me write it for completeness. We, in fact, have some additional properties on the density. No, actually, we will need them. And for all n greater than or equal to 1, for all x, y in i, we have that h n of x minus h n of y less than or equal to k h n x times the distance between x and y, which is less than or equal to k squared times the distance between x and y. So what this says is that these densities are uniformly bounded above and below, and in fact that they're uniformly Lipschitz independently of n, uniformly in this sense. So was this satisfied in the previous example of x goes to 1 half x? Were these conditions satisfied? They were not satisfied because the density was blowing up. It was concentrated in smaller and smaller region. It was getting large. It was unbounded in n, right? Whereas here we're saying the density is uniformly bounded in n. So just to conclude, I will write the proof of why this proposition implies our theorem, and then we will leave it as that. At that. So... Um, Okay, so this is just a simple application of ascoli Azela theorem because this is now proof, proof of theorem, assuming proposition. So Hn. is bounded and equicontinuous because it's uniformly Lipschitz. So by a theorem called ascoli Azela theorem, uh, it converges uniformly to uh, a function satisfying the same properties. So um, Hn converges to H uniformly, and H satisfies both of these conditions. Yeah, some subsequence is okay. Uh, there exists a subsequence. Yes. There exists a subsequence. It, is, it says that this is a compact family, a pre compact family, yes. So let mu be given by mu equals integral mu of a equals integral of a of h dm. So 
So we claim that this is the measure we need, right? So what we've done is we've taken, rather than taking, so on the one hand, we had the weak star limit of these measures, but weak star limit of these measures is not good enough, okay? So what we do is we take the density of these measures, and we show that the densities have a limit where we have much stronger information about this limit because we have these properties about the densities, so we know that the densities converge to a very nice Lipschitz continuous bounded above and below function h, which we use to define mu. Okay, so we took the limit of the densities rather than the limit of the measures, a limit point of the densities. Okay, and then clearly mu is absolutely continuous. by definition. Okay. And then let me, since we have a few minutes left, let me also show that um, the mu is invariant, right? Because what I said before is that the arguments that we used previously use the fact that f is continuous. In this case, we don't really have f continuous, so we just have a slightly different calculation. So let me give it here. So. Mu is absolutely continuous. Now, to show that mu is invariant, to show mu is invariant, also because we're not directly defining mu as a limit of weak star, as a weak star limit of mu n, right? Although it is essentially the same. So um, notice that mu of a is equal by definition h d m, and this is equal to the integral of a of the limit of h n d m. And now we use the dominated convergence theorem that allows us to take the limit out of the integral here. So this is the limit as n tends to infinity of a of h n d m, h n j. So these are all, yes. Sorry, this is all for the subsequence, like you correctly pointed out, h and j. And this is exactly equal to the limit as j tends to infinity of mu and j of a. And by definition of mu and j, this is equal to the limit as j tends to infinity of 1 over nj, the sum i equals 0, nj minus 1, of f star i m of a. And this is just equal to the limit, j tends to infinity, of 1 over nj, of the sum of i equals 0, nj minus 1, of the measure of f minus i of a. So this does not give right exactly what we want, but it's very useful to be right to be able to write this in this way. Right? What we're saying is really that even though we've defined the measure in terms of limit of the densities, this basically corresponds the measure of A is the limit of the measures of F star I M of A, of these averages, right? for each measurable set. And so from this, we easily get the invariance of the measure. So from this now to check the invariance of the measure, Take the measure of f minus 1 of a. We can write using this formula here as the limit as j tends to infinity of 1 over nj times the sum from 0 to nj minus 1 of the measure of f minus i of f minus 1 of a. Okay, so now I'm just applying 
exactly this way of lighting it for the set F minus 1 of A that I have there. And now if you rearrange things a little bit in the usual way, you will get that this is equal to the limit as j tends to infinity of 1 over nj sum i equals 0 to nj minus 1 of the measure of f minus i of a plus 1 over nj of the measure of f minus nj of a minus 1 over nj of the measure of a. So I basically take this, put this one into here, and then I rearrange the sum to get this. Okay, this is very similar calculation to what we did last time. So here in the limit, so here you get, of course, that this, the measure of f minus n j of a is less than or equal to 1 always. This is less than or equal to 1 always. As you divide by n j going to 0, the contribution of this is 0. So in the limit, this is just equal to the limit of this. This is equal to the limit as j tends to infinity of 1 over n j sum i equals 0 to nj minus 1, the measure of f minus i, a, which is exactly by definition the measure mu of a. So this shows that mu is invariant and um, mu is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, which is all we need, right? Because now we can apply the theorem that we had in the previous lecture and we know by the um, absolute continuity and the ergodicity of Lebesgue measure that mu is also uh, ergodic. So mu is also ergodic. Okay, and so there exists an ergodic invariant absolutely continuous probability measure. Ah, good question. Very good question. How do you prove that this mu is unique? Very good question. Why is it unique? It's a perfect way to spend the last 10 minutes is on this question. So can you have two absolutely continuous, so you're right. So we still have to need that, we still need to show that mu is unique. Show that if mu one is uh, uh, absolutely continuous with respect to m, invariant ergodic, and mu two absolutely continuous with respect to m, invariant ergodic, implies mu1 equals mu2. This is what we need to show. Oh, well, this is a more general statement, but in particular it will imply that. Um,
Yes, in fact, we need uh, something a little bit more here. We need... Um, sorry. So... Um, Okay, let me write it like this. Then either mu1 is singular with respect to mu2 or mu1 equals mu2. So the reason is you can have this situation, which is the example that we did at the beginning, right, if you remember, where we had this example here. Remember this example here? So in this example, Lebesgue measures invariant, but it's not ergodic, because Lebesgue measure is restricted to 0, 1. So this is 0, 1. So if we write mu 1 is equal to Lebesgue measure restricted to 0, 1 half, and mu 2 equals Lebesgue measure restricted to 1 half, 1. So mu1 is Lebesgue measure, uh, normalized. So mu1 is equal to 2 times this, and mu2 is equal to 2 times that. Right? So here mu1 is a probability measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, invariant and ergodic. Mu2 is a ergodic probability measure, yeah, ergodic, invariant, absolutely continuous. But they are singular with respect to each other in the sense that they live in different places. So this, of course, does not have uniqueness. Here you have two invariant ergodic probability measures. OK? So we need some slightly bit more information here. So in this case, what we've proved is a little bit more about the measure. We've also proved that the density of the measure is bounded above and below everywhere. Okay? Whereas in this case, the density of mu1 with respect to Lebesgue measure on the interval is positive here, but it's zero in the part where it does not live. Right? Mu1 has a density which is zero here, and mu2 has a density which is zero here. They're singular with respect to each other. They live on different parts. So the last missing ingredient to show the uniqueness here is to show that, so we have proved that the density H equals the mu by the M is bounded above and below. So if we have another measure, so what we have here is we have also H1 bounded, H2 bounded, and then this implies that they cannot be singular and they have to be the same. So why is that? So if mu1 mu2 are two such measures, then um, by Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, with f i of x converges to the integral of phi d mu 1 for mu 1 almost every x 
and 1 over n, the sum of phi composed with n phi x, converges to phi d mu 2 for mu 2 almost every x. So what does this mean? So in fact, because maybe I, maybe I could have said it a little bit simpler it's because I hadn't prepared the answer to this question, but maybe a simpler way to see it is that because this density is bounded above and below, then mu and m are equivalent, okay, as you said. So m is also absolutely continuous. So since H is bounded above and below, then also the Lebesgue measure is absolutely continuous with respect to mu1, and Lebesgue measure is absolutely continuous with respect to mu2. And so this implies that the set of points that is mu1 measure 1 has also positive Lebesgue measure, in fact, full Lebesgue measure, and the set of points that has full Lebesgue measure with respect to mu2 also has full Lebesgue measure. Sorry? This, this is because it is bounded below. Be Sorry? Excuse me? It's bounded below because the inf, remember the inf of all h and x was greater than zero. That's right. The inf, this is the proposition that the inf of all x and all n is greater than zero, and the limit also satisfies that property. So it's bounded above and below. Okay? And so these are also absolutely continuous. And so this implies that this is actually true for m almost every x, and this is also true for m almost every x. So using the fact that these two are equivalent, you can show that this convergence holds not just for mu1 almost every x, but for Lebesgue almost every x. And the same convergence has to hold also for Lebesgue almost every x. So the intersection of these two sets of full Lebesgue measure has to have full Lebesgue measure. So it means that there's a full, for almost every x, you have both of these convergence, which means for every continuous function, this converges to this and this converges to this, which means that these have to be the same which for every continuous function, which means that mu1 should be equal to mu2. Okay? I could have given a little bit more systematic, but I, these are, this is the essential reason for the uniqueness. Okay? So, mu1 is equal to mu2. Yes? Yes, because if mu1 has measure 0, well, because basically you can write the density, you can write m, you can write 1 over h is the density of m with, is the density dm by d mu, is 1 over h. No, we are assuming that both measures are given in the same way. Oh, I see, you're saying mu2 could be another measure. Ah, you mean, uh, because I, I just say, suppose there exists some other absolutely continuous invariant measure where the density is not bounded above and below. Yes, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know right now, I don't know if I can recover the argument, but if you look at this closely, you will see that you only need it 
for mu1, actually. Because mu1, you only need, because this is true for mu1. Okay? Okay, you're right. Very good. So this is true for mu1, is that this convergence happens for Lebesgue almost every point. If you have another absolutely continuous invariant measure, even not knowing that you have equivalence, the fact that this is true for mu almost every x will imply that it's true only for the positive Lebesgue measure set of points. For set with positive Lebesgue measure. And that is enough to give the contradiction because positive Lebesgue measure, full Lebesgue measure, it still means that this has to be these limits have to be the same for a positive Lebesgue measure set of points. Yes, you're right. To write it down formally and precisely, I shouldn't assume that the other one also has density above and below, but it doesn't need to be for this reason. Well done, yes. Okay, so there's a few points in this last lecture that I had to that I had to kind of just sketch rather than give completely. But I think it was important to finish with this theorem because the, you can think of the overall question, which I think I mentioned at the beginning, was precisely this, was which dynamical systems have physical measures? One of the main examples of physical measures is absolutely continuous invariant ergodic measures. And so here we've defined a very important class of maps called full branch, piecewise expanding or full branch with bounded distortion maps which always have a unique physical measure in this way. Okay, So I think at least it gives you some kind of idea of the kind of questions and the kind of techniques that are used in this area which we call uh, differentiable ergodic theory because it uses the language of probability theory to understand systems that have some differentiable properties and we use this. Right? To prove the bounded distortion, we use the derivative, the second derivative and so on. We use differentiable properties of the map to study the ergodic properties. Okay. So I hope it's been interesting <laughs> and very best wishes with your courses. We can finish here.